Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have today Dominic Elsa uh, for the next seminar in our, in our quantum encounter series. So Dominic is a is a condensed matter theorist. He well, he he's been doing many things, including uh, some more exotic things like uh, he's been just this year awarded the New Horizons in Physics Prize for his work on time crystals. So congratulations. Uh, but for today's uh, seminar, he chose something uh, more classic uh, condensed matter subject, metals. So uh, he's going to talk about emergent symmetries and, and anomalies in metals. Please, Dominic, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me here to talk in a virtual sense. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this work that uh, um, well, mainly describing this paper that I wrote with Ryan Fongren at Centel. Um, although I will also mention some more recent works that Centel and I have uh, done as well. Um, okay, so if we want to talk about a quantum many body system, you know, many, many quantum degrees of freedom in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, in terms of the low temperature properties, there's two different things that could happen. The system could be gapped, uh, which means you have a ground state and then you have a, a non-zero gap, even in a thermodynamic limit to the excited states. And we know that in uh, a gap system, even though at low temperature, you basically just have a ground state, the ground state itself can have many non-trivial topological properties. So these are, gives rise to topological phases of matter, such as the integer fractional quantum hole effect, topological insulators, and they're all related to basically the quantum entanglement in the, in the ground state. Uh, and in recent years, I would say the, the general theory of these topological phases has been much better appreciated than, than it was before. Um, but in, in this talk, I want to talk more about uh, gapless systems, actually, and a specific kind of gapless system, with namely a, a metal. So for the purpose of this talk, you can say metal is just a system with a global UN symmetry, uh, charge conservation, and uh, no charge gap. So this, these tower of gapless states above the ground state, you know, they 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 carry charge. So uh, so you have charged excitations going down to the to the lowest energies. Um, if there was no charge gap, then of course the system. If there was a charge gap, of course then the system would be a, an insulator. Um, if we're being more precise, I would have to distinguish in metals and semi-metals. This, this um, definition would apply both to metals and semi-metals, but let me not worry about that for the purpose of this talk. Um, so although, uh, as uh, was mentioned, metals might be a very uh, classic thing to consider in condensed mass physics, in this talk I want to show that you can use ideas that originated in the study of gap topological phases to actually gain a lot of insight into, into metals. Uh, so let's just briefly recap the, the theories of, of metals. So the simplest kind of metal would be, of course, a non-interacting electron gas. Uh, you have a um, electrons that move in, in space, um, but they don't interact except through the uh, Fermi statistics. Um, so then you, the electrons just occupy single particle states. Single particle states, assuming you have momentum conservation, is labeled by momentum. Um, and then, um, so in the ground state, you would occupy some set of single particle states, and then uh, the Fermi surface is just the, the boundary and momentum space between the occupied and unoccupied states. Um, and the low energy excitations, of course, are the electrons and holes that uh, sit near the Fermi surface. Uh, so now maybe we want to switch on the interactions again. And so that brings us to this famous Fermi liquid theory. So once you have interactions, you, can, you cannot label the, the uh, eigenstates just by the single particle states because the, a single particle state at some momentum would just scatter from the interaction. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Fermi liquid theory tells us, at least for some class of systems, it's, it's valid to consider still that there's a, some kind of Fermi surface, uh, sharp Fermi surface. And then uh, the excitations near the Fermi surface can be described in terms of these quasi particles, which have a very long lifetime. Actually, the lifetime goes to infinity right on the Fermi surface. Uh, and they're kind of dressed versions of the original electrons. And so, in terms of the low energy exit physics, at least, you can understand it in terms of these quasi particles. Uh, and then there's this very important result um, for Fermi liquid theory, Lundgren's theorem, that says that the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface uh, is the same as it would be even without interactions. 
Um, so even though the interactions can uh, renormalize in general the shape of a Fermi surface, it, they cannot actually change the volume enclosed. Dominic, can you remind me, please, how do these quasi particles decay? Uh, like, what can they decay into? Um, in, into some quasi particles which are even closer to the Fermi surface? What's, what's happening here? I forgot. Well, the quasi particles very close to the Fermi surface to kind of don't decay. So you have to go a little bit off the Fermi surface and then yeah. it kind of decays into the, the continuum. I don't think there's a a simple way to say it. Um, Into the continuum. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you create a quasi particle and then it decays, it kind of goes into a. I mean, the quasi particle is like a dressed version of a single particle state, but then it just goes into some many particle state that I don't think you can describe simply. But is there here some something related to the fact that momentum is not conserved, or even in the presence of momentum? The momentum, uh, yeah, momentum is conserved. We we will always assume yeah. in this talk that momentum is conserved. But uh, you know, so so whatever final state you get will have the same momentum, but yes. it won't be just made up of a single quasi particle. It'll be some many particle state. Okay. okay thank you. But in any case, the, the, the main properties of Fermi liquid theory, you know, are, come from the, the infinite, assuming infinite lifetime. So the, um, the decay is kind of the leading correction to Fermi liquid theory, if you like. Um, okay, so, so that's Fermi liquid theory. Um, and this is uh, um, a very famous theory. It successfully describes many um, materials uh, at low temperatures, but uh, not all materials. As we now know, there are many materials, um, including some famous class of materials like cuprates, um, which also host high temperature superconductivity, that uh, Fermi liquid theory is just clearly an inadequate description of uh, those materials. And then so the question becomes, if, it's, if you cannot describe these materials by Fermi liquid theory, then what is the correct theory? And that's a very hard problem. And in many cases, such as the cuprates, not well understood at all uh, at the moment. Uh, but in general, if you go beyond Fermi liquid, say you have a metal, but it's not described by Fermi liquid theory, it, that's what we call a non Fermi liquid. Uh, and so, non Fermi liquids, you do often find both experimentally and maybe from some theoretical models that they have some kind of sharp Fermi surface. Nevertheless, the sharp Fermi surface is no longer associated with these well defined quasi particles. Um, you have more strongly interacting quantum soup particles that cannot be described just in, in a quasi-particle language. And so then there are different, I mean, apart from the question of, you know, what exactly should, is the theoretical description of these things, which is maybe a very hard problem to answer, there are some broader conceptual questions that one can ask as well. Like, what exactly do we mean by a Fermi surface in these systems, if it's not the place where the quasi-particles are? Um, uh, you know, the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface, does it still obey some kind of Lattinger's theorem like constraint or not? Uh, so, these are questions I would like to address in this talk. Um, but also, I would like to pose a, a more general question, which maybe these specific questions will be an instance of. Uh, so, the question basically is so we know probably what's going to happen in, for any given material, we probably know what's happening microscopically. It's just going to be described by some Hamiltonian that involves electrons hopping on some lattice. Um, so that's a microscopic Hamiltonian. Of course, as we know, it's very hard to predict from a microscopic Hamiltonian in a quantum many-body system, you know, what the nature of the low energy physics could be. You know, uh, that's a quantum many-body problem is a hard problem and uh, there are many exotic behaviors that could occur and so degrees of freedom at low energies, um, maybe, you know, can be emergent degrees of freedom that don't have much to do with the microscopic degrees of freedom. Um, but nevertheless, the question, you can ask the following question. You, say, you can ask, what questions does the IR theory? So the IR theory, of course, here I just mean the, you know, if you like, you can think of the renormalization group, but it's just for, for whatever theory that describes just for low energy physics of the material. Um, what properties does the IR theory need to satisfy uh, if it's going to emerge from a particular microscopic model? Like maybe you can't fully predict from a microscopic model what the IR theory is going to be, but at least can we place some constraints on um, you know, what properties of an IR theory would be compatible with the uh, 
microscopic model. And so that's what we call the question of, uh, sorry, the question of emergibility, like what kind of IR theories can emerge as the, as the low energy physics of some particular microscopic model. And so let me uh, say it more precisely now, or, or pose a more precise question. So the, uh, so the microscopic cell, we have a microscopic Hamiltonian. In particular, I'm gonna assume of a microscopic cell, we have this particular symmetry group. So we have charge conservation symmetry uh, and lattice translation symmetry, which is an appropriate symmetry group for, for metals, for example. So that's a microscopic symmetry. And then from a microscopic symmetry, you can define this number. It's a real number, which we call the filling. It's a very important number throughout my talk. And the filling just represents the uh, average charge per unit cell. So in general, this can be, uh, could be any real number. And then the question is, you know, given that we have this microscopic constraints, the microscopic symmetry and the microscopic filling, uh, then uh, what constraints does that lead to uh, in terms of the uh, low energy physics? Okay. So, can uh, it be any real number? Shouldn't it be a, a rational number? Or, or well, that, that's going to be an important distinction later in metal. But for a metal, it can be any real number because uh, for, for a metal, basically, uh, the Goddard's theorem says that, says that the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface is equal to nu. So, um, because the Fermi surface, you can deform it continuously, there's no constraint. Uh, you can continuously tune this number new in a, in a metal. But where do these electrons come from? Uh, sorry for a naive question. I'm not <laughs> an expert clearly, but I, I thought that okay, these electrons, they just come from some atoms which share the electrons, uh, or are going to inject some extra electrons into your lattice from outside to change the spinning fraction continuously? Uh, yeah, well, um... It's sort of a theoretical thing. I mean, in, in well, I mean, often you know, there's some chemical chemistry constraint, right? That each atom contributes some number of exactly. electrons. Exactly, that's what they could. Um, but you know, theoretically, you can just uh, you know add more electrons into the system and see see what happens. I mean, uh, in practice, you could do this, for example, in a two-dimensional material by gate, gating the material, or, you know, applying some uh, electric field that will uh, basically change change the equilibrium charge density. Uh -huh. Or you can also uh, imagine doping the material um, in, with dopants, and then that changes the electron concentration. Although you're, that's a little subtle because it might break the translation symmetry because you have disorder. But in, in mm -hmm. certain regimes, you can just take into account the change in density from the dopants and not worry about the disorder. OK. Um, so. so Maybe I'll ask, uh, so in general, when you have a symmetry group, then uh, the charge uh, is an element of what? I mean, uh, given a symmetry group, just confused, uh, like you have ZD times U1, and then uh, if, if you just have a symmetry, uh, let's say abstract group G, then uh, the charge would be an element of what space? Well, I guess in general, the ch charge is an element of a dual, of that group, but here I'm really just assuming that uh, here by charge I mean the U1 charge, so it's the charge under the U1 symmetry. Yes, but so the dual would be the discrete. I, I think I have the same question as Lava. I'm, 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 I'm uh, like usually when we have U1 symmetry group, that's that's the reason why uh, the usual charge in quantum field theory is discrete because it's, it lies in the character lattice of U1. Yeah, so the total charge of a system has to be an integer, but here I'm talking about the charge per unit cell, so you divide the total charge by the number of by the volume the number of unit cells so that can be a, a, some real number so I, I guess it's true that for any finite system you has to be rational but you know we, we're always considering here the thermodynamic limits so um uh so the next, there it will be valid to consider any any real number yeah i i i'm, I'm more comfortable now than next so i don't know about proceeding but i'm happy um i also have a question about this filling um number if you um so depending on what kind of state you have it'll tell you what kind of filling uh number you have so in particular you're looking at not just um the system but all states that admit this filling number as well or am i misunderstanding something well it's not always so i mean if you really know the microscope i'm turning then you know the filling number but my question my question is more like suppose you only know the nature of the low energy theory what is the relationship between that and the feeling? Um, that's not obvious uh, a priori. Uh, 
uh, it's sort of the question I want to answer in this talk that, uh, you know, it's not a totally trivial question because it's often pretty hard to see from the nature of the long theory what it has to do with the microscopic feeling, at least without the theory that I'm going to give you. Got it. Okay, thank you. So first point is that suppose the feeling wasn't an integer, then it doesn't really impose any constraints on the low energy theory because um, we know that you can have an integer feeling and then the theory can just be literally an atomic insulator. So you just have some atoms and then you put some number of electrons on each atom and the electrons just stay very tightly bound to the atoms so they're not moving around or anything. So obviously, you know, then the feeling has to be an integer because, you know, you choose how many electrons you want to put on each atom. Um, but you know, the, the low energy theory of an atomic insulator is basically completely trivial. First of all, it's gapped. And secondly, the ground state doesn't even have any non-trivial topological order or anything because it's just like literally a product state. So um, you know, this you would say the IR theory is literally you know, the trivial theory. And, and yet, you know, new can still be any integer. So the, the integer theory is compatible with totally trivial low energy theories. So the interesting constraints will come about if new is not an integer. And so uh, an example of a result along these lines is this famous result of Richard Smadash, Oshikawa Hastings. Suppose you have a system that has U1 charge conservation symmetry and lattice translation symmetry, and suppose the microscopic theorem is not an integer, so it has some non-trivial fractional part. Uh, then either one of the, the theorem states that one of these possibilities must be true. Either one of the symmetries is spontaneously broken, or the system must have ground state degeneracy of a torus, which I guess would mean you have some kind of topological order, or the system must be gapless. Okay, so that's already a very strong constraint on the nature of the low energy physics, just coming from this feeling not being integer. But we would like to go a bit beyond this. I mean, this result, although powerful, is still a bit vague. First of all, there's you know these three different possibilities. Secondly, each of these possibilities is still very general. Like for example, gapless. I mean, there's so many different kinds of gaplessness, um, and so we would like to have a you know a stronger statement than this. And so in order to do this. Um, so, okay, we'll assume that filling is non-zero mod one, because if it was zero mod one, it would be an integer, and so then, then there's no constraint. Um, and then you, we want to address what the constraints are of the low energy theory. In order to do that, I'm going to make connections of the idea of emergent symmetries and anomalies, um, which is, as I mentioned, also related to the theory of uh, gap topological phases. Um, so I'm going to illustrate this by an example, first of all. So I'm going to consider a Ludinger liquid. So this is a, a one-dimensional system. Um, so you can think of a non-interacting limit where it's just a one-dimensional uh, non-interacting electron gas. And then, you know, similar to the picture I drew before, you just fill up these single particle states. And then the Fermi surface here is just a pair of points. That's what I call the Fermi points. So these are where the low energy excitations live. You can also switch on back on the interactions and you get a what's called a Ludinger liquid, although uh, that it turns out that distinction, although very important for many things, uh, will not be very important for what I'm going to say. So if you like, you can just think about the non-interacting limit, but the statements still hold with interactions as well. Um, so this theory actually has an emergent symmetry, which is an interesting property. Uh, so microscopically, of course, you have a single U1 symmetry, um, but in, in an emergent sense of so symmetry of the low energy theory, uh, is actually u1 times u1 because the, the charge at the left moving point and the charge at the right moving point uh, is separately conserved, you know, in the low energy theory. So that's an emergent symmetry, and then this emergent symmetry also has an interesting property, uh, which is it has a, an anomaly, and what that means here is that if you apply an electric field to the system, then the left and right moving charges are no longer separately conserved. Without without the electric field, they would be separately conserved. But um, you apply the electric field, they're no longer separately conserved. And so we have this non-trivial continuity equation um, for the left and right moving currents with a non-trivial right hand side proportional to the right to the electric field, which is telling you that these left and right moving charges are not separately conserved. Of course, the total charge is still conserved because if you add these two equations, the right hand sides will cancel. But uh, the left and right moving charges are not separately conserved. And so this is a more general example of something that we call a Tooft anomaly. I, I will define what I mean by Tooft anomaly uh, in a minute. But first of all, I want to argue in what way this is related to a uh, topological phases. And in order to do that, I'm going to suppose I, I, so this is an emergent symmetry, but suppose I wanted to have this kind of same kind of structure with this anomaly, et cetera, 
but where you these left and right moving symmetries become microscopic symmetries. So a way to do that would be suppose that you have a symmetry that, a system that microscopically has both charge conservation and also uh, conservation of the z component of spin. Um, so that could be a, a plausible microscopic symmetry. And then if you wanted to have the same anomaly structure for this uh, microscopic Q1 times U1, basically what you would want to say is that the, uh, you have some kind of gapless point where the right moving modes carry spin up and the left moving modes carry spin down. So people, oh, this is what people call helical modes. It's like the, the direction that the electron is moving is locked to the spin. Um, and so then the, you know, if you think about the conservation of, of up spins and conservation of down spins, then that maps onto this uh, conservation of left movers and right movers, which I described on the previous slide. But the interesting thing about these helical modes is that they can only occur on the boundary of a topological phase in one high dimension. It can actually never occur in a strictly one dimensional system. So you can have a topological phase. So this is, you know, some gapped phase of matter, um, but where the ground state has some non-trivial topological properties. Uh, and then a manifestation of those non-trivial topological properties on the boundary will be, first of all, the boundary is kind of forced to be gapless. Um, and secondly, uh, the boundary theory has this uh, anomaly structure that if you apply an electric field, the um, upspins and downspins are not separately conserved anymore. And so there is this general correspondence, bulk boundary correspondence between Tooft anomalies in these spatial dimensions. And so Tooft anomaly just really means it's, um, well, maybe this is not the most general definition, but it's, it's sufficient for this talk. Uh, Tooft anomaly is the non conservation of charge in response to a background gauge field. So, for example, you applied an electric field and the left and right, move, left and right movers were not conserved anymore. So, that was an example of a Tooft anomaly. Um, and so, there's, a, there's this bulk boundary correspondence where a non trivial topological phase, like a topological insulator, for example, uh, in D plus one spatial dimensions, has this boundary theory that carries this Tooft anomaly on the, on the boundary. And so in some sense, the Tooft anomaly and the um, topological phase are just two sides of the same coin there. The classification of Tooft anomalies is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the classification of topological phases in one higher dimension, or, or specifically symmetry protected topological phases in one higher dimension. So, but now coming back to this Lundgren liquid, I, I said that these Tooft anomalies can only occur if a boundary of a topological phase in one higher dimension, but then maybe you find this statement strange because, um, I mean, a, a luxury liquid is just a one dimensional metal. Like you would say, why it doesn't have to be on the boundary of anything. Well, the key, the key word here is there's emergent symmetry. This is, it normally is defined with respect to this emergent symmetry. So it is, it is perfectly okay for emergent symmetries to have uh, anomalies, even if you're not on the boundary of the high dimensional topological phase. But if you wanted to make this emergent symmetry microscopic, that's when you would have this obstruction. Um, okay, so this Lange liquid, of course, can exist in 1D because the symmetry is emergent. Um, but the Tooft anomaly, you know, it can still be helpful to think about this high dimensional topological phase just because we know that the classification of the Tooft anomalies is in one to one correspondence with the classification of topological phases in one high dimension. Sorry, let me try to understand you. So basically what you are saying here is that you want the anomaly to be there in the infrared, but along the RG flow is not there because your symmetry is, is broken. Yeah, I mean, because the microscopic theory doesn't have the symmetry, you know, there's no to sense of the anomaly. Okay, in the, in the, in the, uh, sorry, uh, somebody was saying something that I didn't hear. Maybe, I don't know if that was a question. That was just a noise. I see. Um, yeah, you're right. So you, you cannot match this anomaly from the UV in the IR because the, the symmetry is not present in the UV. Uh, so now I want to show you how you can um, derive Lundgren's theorem from perspective, perspective of this anomaly. Um, so here, essentially, I'm guess I'm, I'm I'm following this seminal paper by Yamanaka Oshikawa Affleck. You know, but I, I'm, I'm not phrasing it, things exactly in the way that they did because they didn't talk about you know anomalies. It was not in those words, but, but essentially, it's the argument that, that they that they gave. Um. So okay, we have this 
So the, the first thing we need to do is we, want to, we have this a microscopic level. We have, well, we assume that we have some lattice translation symmetry. And then you have to say, well, the lattice translation symmetry somehow needs to be manifested in the low energy theory. And so yeah, in particular, it's going to look like this. So NL and NR here are the generators of the left and right moving charges, which, um, so these are the generators of the U1 times U1 symmetry, the emergent symmetry. Um, so the lattice translation symmetry just acts like this, like KO and KR are just the momenta of the left moving and right moving Fermi points. We have some amount of charge here and some amount of charge here. You can see that this is how much momentum you're carrying. Um, notice that the, although it's a translation to the microscopic, it actually maps into an internal symmetry of the IR theory, which is actually a, a general feature because it's related to the rescaling as you go from the UV to the IR. Um, so this is how the translation symmetry acts in the IR theory. And so now uh, what we're going to do, so this is a picture in real space here, now not momentum space. We can take our one-dimensional system, we're going to put it on a ring, and then we're going to slowly switch on a magnetic flux. So as a function of time, you go from zero magnetic flux to a two pi magnetic flux. Uh, so we know from Faraday's law that, you know, that generates an electric field. Um, so therefore, uh, you can, that's where the Tooth anomaly comes into play, uh, because you apply an electric field to the system. And in particular, you can show that if you do this flux threading process as you go from zero to two pi, the well, left moving charge actually shifts exactly by one, and then the right moving charge shifts by one. And since we've expressed the translation operator in terms of these left and right moving charges, uh, you can now see how the translation operator is going to shift. Um, and so essentially, it's the same because translation operator is the momentum, that the momentum gets shifted by this process. Of course, you, you're applying an electric field, so it makes sense that the system is going to feel a force and so the momentum will get shifted. Um, so this is all the statements that hold, you know, respective of the, the low energy theory. But then we also know what's going to happen microscopically. Microscopically, the, um, you know, the, the force, the momentum that the system picks up has to be proportional to the charge density. Or more precisely, uh, with lattice sensation symmetry, uh, and you do this two pi flux threading, the, the translation operator will get shifted by amount proportional to nu. So you remember nu is this uh, number I introduced previously of filling, so it's, it's the charge per unit cell. Um, okay, so these are just two descriptions of the same process from two different perspectives. So you have to equate these two shifts. Um, and so you conclude that uh, KR minus KR, which is here basically volume enclosed by the Fermi surface is equal to nu, at least uh, mod one. And so this is Lundin's theorem for this one-dimensional system. But the important thing to note here is that I have not uh, assumed anything about the low energy physics. You know, I actually didn't need to know anything about Lundin's liquids, really. Um, the only thing I needed to know was, firstly, that you have this U1 times U1 emergent symmetry. Secondly, that it has this Twift anomaly. And then you need to say how the translation operator maps into the IR theory. Uh, and that was the only ingredients you needed to, to drive Lundin's theorem. So the point is that Okay, you can do this question. very generally. Sorry, is a question. So, so I, I, yeah, this, so usually one says that the Slotinger theorem relates interaction Fermi system to free Fermi system, but here kind of just prove it generally. You didn't assume that the system was, there, there was no interaction that you had to turn on. Well, usually one says that this has to be some adiaboticity, you relate things to, to the free theory. Yeah, so exactly. Is, so there, is there this aspect here present? Or yeah, so you don't know, you know, you do not need to assume anything like that here, which is the power of this approach. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, that's the beauty of, um, I mean, that, that, that statement is also true for this paper. You know, that's really the beauty of this paper, but it does not require uh, any perturbative argument. It's really true non perturbatively, it's a non perturbative statement. Right. Okay, thanks. So we don't need to restrict ourselves just to energy liquids. Um, the point is that this flux gradient argument is something you can do in any theory. You know, you know, whatever the nature of the low energy physics is, you can do this flux gradient argument. Um, the conclusion that you obtain is that um, you only need to know these particular features of the low energy theory. You need to know it's an emergent symmetry, which I call GIR here. You have to know how the microscopic symmetries map into GIR. Um, so the microscopic symmetry here is assumed to be uh, translations uh, and charge conservation. So you have to know how these map into the IR theory. 
uh, so it's mathematically this would be like a group homomorphism from ZD times U1 into GIR. Um, and then you need to know the two anomaly of the IR symmetry. And then by doing this flux written argument, basically you obtain a general form where that's the compute you're suing uh, in any loan theory whatsoever. Is, you just need to know these, these ingredients. So I know this the ultimate generalization of the theorem because the theorem is a statement about um, a particular kind of theory, like for example, Fermi liquids or Lange liquids. But this result is a statement about any low energy theory whatsoever. It, it, there's a general prescription to com compute the filling. Sorry, sorry. I want to understand more clearly. So uh, this U1 XL, it comes from the, uh, the translation, lattice translation. I wouldn't say comes from, I mean, it's just a property of low energy theory that it has this emergent symmetry, but it's true that the um, uh, microscopic translation will map into that axial symmetry. Yes, so, so, so my question is this, suppose, uh, uh, suppose uh, would, would this kind of symmetry always be anomalous in the infrared? Basically, I mean, symmetry is that kind of originated from translation. Well, it has to be anomalous if the filling is non-zero, because if the tooth anomaly was trivial, then the filling would just be zero, because the, then the flux rate argument kind of doesn't do anything to the system because it, there's no anomaly. So then the filling would be zero. So if you have non-zero filling, then you always need to have an anomaly. I see. Thank you. Yeah, so non-zero mod one. It's always, everything is mod one here. Um, So, so, so these arguments can be done in any spatial dimension. I, previously, I just presented you the one-dimensional version, but you know, here I'm saying you could have d -dim spatial dimensions. And so I want to, you know, maybe not do it in average spatial dimension, although you can do it. I, but I want to at least consider the d equals two case um, and show you how that works because, and that's uh, maybe also a bit more novel compared with this uh, flux, famous flux threading argument. So I'm going to show you how these arguments work in in two spatial dimensions now. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to consider a Fermi liquids in two spatial dimensions, although as before, uh, the arguments will hold more generally. So there's an important property of Fermi liquid theory, um, was emphasized perhaps by Haldane, it has a very large emergent symmetry group actually. The, the larger liquid has U1 times U1, but Fermi liquid has a much larger emergent symmetry. Uh, so this is the famous Hamiltonian of Fermi liquid theory. Um, and in particular, this Hamiltonian has a property that the charge at every point of a Fermi surface is separately conserved. So the emergent symmetry, you know, in terms of emergent symmetry, so the, this is the low energy properties. Um, so the emergent symmetry group is actually infinite dimensional because the, the generator is like the charge at each point of a Fermi surface. So let, let me be a bit more precise about what the emergent symmetry group is. Uh, I said that the charge at each point of a Fermi surface is separately conserved. It's not really that you have a U1 symmetry to it for each point of a Fermi surface, I mean, because there's, you know, the Fermi surface, the set of all points of a Fermi surface is an uncountable set. So you want to the uncountable infinity is not a very well-defined object. So it's not quite that you have U1 for each one of a Fermi surface. The correct statement is that for each point, there's a conserved linear charge density. And by charge density, I mean that it's the thing that you integrate over theta. So theta here is just some coordinate parameterizing of the one dimensional Fermi surface. Um, the total charge is the integral of this uh, linear charge density. So it's a charge density in theta space, not in like real space. Um, and so uh, the point of this linear charge density is something, it's really something that you integrate against test functions. So you, a general element of the emergent symmetry group can be written as uh, like this. So you take some smooth function f of theta, you integrate over against the n of theta, uh, and then take exponential. So that gives you the most general element of the emergent symmetry group. Uh, and then so quantization of total charge uh, will give you a constraint that uh, you want to identify f theta with f theta plus two pi. So f theta really lives on a circle or on u1 if you like. So the total, the, in, in summary, the, the actual precise definition of emergent symmetry group of a 2D Fermi liquid which somehow I don't think anyone actually stated until we wrote our paper, is that uh, it's the group of smooth functions from the circle into U1. Uh, and this is something that mathematicians have called the loop group of U1. Okay, so that, that's the emergent symmetry group of a 2D thermal liquid. So is that clear? Physically, it's just rep it's reflecting the fact that you have conservation of charge, but each point on the Fermi surface separately. <laughs> 
because quasi-particles cannot scatter, at least in, in the low energy theory. There's no quasi-particle scattering. So the, if you have a quasi-particle somewhere, it just stays there forever. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Um, and so this loop group symmetry actually has an anomaly. So there are many manifestations that you can talk about. Let me just focus on one particular manifestation of this anomaly. It's basically you, you insert a two pi magnet flux to the system. So unlike in the 1D case, I'm not thinking of this as a function of time. I just, configure, I just consider some static configuration where you have two pi flux sitting somewhere in your two-dimensional system. Um, you imagine that the magnet field is very weak. So we spread this two pi flux over a very large area. Um, and so on this object, it turns out that this loop group symmetry actually acts projectively. So um, without any magnetic field, the loop group symmetry is just an, an abelian group, although it's infinite dimensional. Um, but when acting on this particular object, the, uh, loop, the loop group actually gets a central extension. So in particular, the, there's this non-trivial commutator. So n of theta here, remember, was, was the generators of a loop group. This non-trivial commutator that n of theta has. It, if the commutator is proportional to this contact term, uh, which involves the derivative of the Dirac dollar function. So this is the manifestation of the anomaly that you have is projected representation when acting on a magnetic flux. And so this coefficient here is actually quantized for a Fermi liquid, at least a spinless Fermi liquid, the, the coefficient here is just one. Um, in general, uh, it's consistent to have any integer si hi sitting here. So that's like the quantized anomaly coefficient. Uh, for a spinless Fermi liquid, it's just one. Um, uh, Dome, can you give just a, an idea how one derives this result? Because I'm, I'm a bit uh, doubtful. Um, Suppose that it's just for Fermi liquid, uh, how would I, what, what should I do in order to compute this commutator? Well, there's different ways you can think about deriving it. I mean, um, the way we did in the paper, which I don't know if it's the best way or not, is we considered the semi-classical equations, like, you know, we know that the, the quasi-particles in a Fermi liquid, or especially in the non-tracking case, can be represented by some semi-classical equations of motion. Uh, the semi-classical equations of motion, um, you know, come from a, a Hamiltonian, you know, a canonical Hamiltonian in, in the, you know, in the classical Hamiltonian language. Uh, and also you can define Poisson brackets in that picture. And so you can just uh, switch on the magnetic field, derive the Poisson brackets of these density operators, and then you just sort of claim in quantum mechanics, Poisson brackets will become a commutator. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's still a little formal, but okay, I don't have a, 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 a clearer physical argument than that, but it's mathematically, it's a precise statement. Can I ask also a question? Uh, yes. Um, is this uh, symmetry, uh, loop group symmetry, acting only on uh, the zero energy quasi particles or also away from the Fermi surface? Well, on the low energy, it's, it's emergent symmetry for low energy theory. So you you would, but so you, it would be defined respect to the low energy excit excitations, but not, it doesn't have to be exactly on the Fermi surface, but you know, close to, close enough to the Fermi surface that you're still in the low energy regime. But as you described before, when you are not exactly on the Fermi surface, the excitation decays. Yeah, but it decays, you know, slowly in the sense that, um, you know, it's like as you go omega away from the Fermi surface, the scattering rate is omega squared. So um, those terms that cause the scattering, if you think about it in the language of renormalization group are uh, irrelevant. So you can consider the, the RG fixed point theory where those irrelevant terms are set to zero. Uh, once you put those terms back in, of course, the, the emergent symmetry will be broken, which is the usual story of emergent symmetries. I see. Okay, thanks. So this is the commutator. Um, so this is the, the anomaly. And so now I'm going to use this anomaly to drive Lodge's theorem. So I don't know. So the question of what, why is this commutator true? Maybe you know the fact that it reproduces Lodge's theorem. You know, maybe that's Okay, that would be kind of a circular argument, I suppose. But uh, anyway, it will give some some insight. Um, 
So, okay, we have this object that we want to consider, this 2 pi magnetic flux. Um, and then we want to, um, so let's consider microscopically what's going to happen. So microscopically, we have this discrete translation operators now in two dimensions, so we have X and Y translations. And then we can consider this 2 pi magnetic flux in this object Tx, Ty, Tx inverse, Ty inverse, acting on the 2 pi magnetic flux. And so I claim that acting on the 2 pi flux, uh, you get a non-trivial non phase factor that's proportional to the microscopic filling. Uh, there's a hat. I mean, you can give a precise argument for this as we did in the paper, but let me just give you the hand wave inversion. Um, if you have a two by flux and then you act on it with this object, it's kind of like you're moving it around one unit cell, but a unit cell contains by definition charge nu. So then you get an Aaron of Bohm phase, uh, e to the two pi i nu. So that's the rough argument anyway. So, so that's what happens microscopically. And then uh, as before, we, we want to match it with something that's happening in the IR theory. So first of all, you need to say, how does the microscopic translations act in the IR theory? So they will act like this. So we have our Fermi surface, uh, uh, you know, parameterized. So we parameterize the location of the Fermi surface by this parameter theta and kx theta, ky theta is the momentum of the Fermi surface as a function of theta. Um, so, uh, so this Tx, and here I just say alpha equals x and y, x or y. And so Tx and Ty will, will map in this way into the Lorentz theory. Um, so again, it's an internal symmetry. Um, and now we can consider this two-pi magnetic flux, and then we know that we have this commutator of the NF theta's. Um, the conclusion is that uh, because the Tx is and Ty is expressed in terms of the NF theta's now, you can compute this commutator of the Tx and Ty, and you'll see that it's proportional to this integral because uh, it's derivative of a direct delta function, you integrate by parts, basically, you get this integral. And this integral is just computing the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface. So now, all you have to do is you compare these two equations, and you'll see that the uh, volume enclosed by the Fermi surface is equal to the microscopic fill in mod one. So again, this is Lunge's theorem, derived in a non-perturbative way, and it only depends on uh, as before, the emergent symmetry, in this case, the loop group symmetry, uh, the, the mapping of the translations into the uh, low energy theory, you can actually sort of think of this as defining the Fermi surface in the most general context, um, because whatever the translation is, it has to somehow map into some operator. This is the most general form of a, operator in the low, of a, of a symmetry operator in the low energy theory. So that you can think of this as just the definition of a Fermi surface. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then you need the uh, anomaly of the emergent symmetry, which is this equation. And from these ingredients, you, you rederive this constraint of Lunge's theorem. Okay, is that clear? So as before, it's the same thing that I promised you before. The only ingredients that you need are the emergent symmetry, the mapping from microscopic symmetries into the emergent symmetry, and the Tooft anomaly. And then there's a general form of driver filling, um, just by, by doing the same procedure in a, in a general, whatever the most general theory is, you insert the two-pi flux and compute the, the commutator of the um, translations. It gives you the filling. So, uh, so, okay, so what can we do with this? I mean, you can try to apply this to many different theories and, and, and compute what their filling is in terms of energy physics, which is uh, pretty useful, um, but there's also, um, things you can do. Once you have a general formula, you can prove general theorems. And so let me tell you about some of the general theorems that we proved based on this formula. So one of them is the following. So suppose that the filling is an irrational number. Then the uh, emergent symmetry group cannot be a compact finite dimensional D group. They should mention D greater than equal to two. So D equals one, Lodinger's liquid will be a, um, a kind of example. But for D greater than equal to two, we have this theorem um, that we can derive based on these general arguments. So what is the significance of this theorem? Well, particular, uh, if you have a compressible state, which means that nu is continuously tunable, um, which, so generally you expect metals to be, metals to be compressible. Um, if you have a compressible state, um, when nu is continuously tunable, then in particular, you can tune nu to be irrational. And then so the consequences of this theorem will then apply. So okay, insulators are not are generally incompressible, so you wouldn't um, have this result. But uh, for compressible states, which generally expect metals to be compressible, even for non-fermi liquids, um, you have this conclusion. You conclude that the emergent symmetry group cannot be a compact finite dimensional group in spatial dimension d greater than two. 
So for example, Fermi liquids satisfy this theorem because they have this, uh, I mean, they're, they're compressible, but they have this infinite dimensional loop group symmetry. And so the point is that just from this uh, compressibility assumption, basically you conclude that there must be this very non-trivial emergent symmetry structure. Um, either it's this infinite dimensional loop group, loop group I guess the theorem doesn't include, doesn't necessarily exclude some alternate infinite dimensional group, although we don't really have any known examples of that. Um, but compressibility does at least give you some very non-trivial emergent symmetry structure as a consequence. Okay, so then we can ask, what is the possible emergent symmetry groups for a compressible state of matter? And say it's focused on spatial dimension d equals two. Because it cannot be, it definitely cannot be trivial and it cannot in fact be any finite dimensional Lie group. Um, so what could it be? Uh, what is the most general possibility? So, okay, we, in Fermi liquid, we know that we have this uh, infinite dimensional glue group symmetry. Um, you could consider some non-Fermi liquid that nevertheless still has the same emergent symmetry group, and that's what we call an ersatz Fermi liquid. So if you're non-Fermi liquid, you don't have quasi-particles anymore, but that doesn't necessarily rule out the possibility that it could be a conserved charge at each point on the Fermi surface. Uh, so there's this possibility that non-Fermi liquids still have the same emergent symmetry structure as a Fermi liquid. Uh, and if that's the case, then uh, there are many consequences of that because, for example, you can derive Leibniz's theorem even for non-Fermi liquids because it just comes from the anomaly of this emergent symmetry. Uh, are there examples the of such, uh, such states where this symmetry is present is it hypothetical or do such examples exist that uh, this ersatz for liquids? Well, um, there are some examples like uh, there is uh, theories of non Fermi liquids where you have a Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson. Uh, and in this theory, you see that the uh, actually the of over this kind of scattering. Um, it's very like small wavelength scattering in the low energy limit. The, there's no long wavelength scattering. Sorry, sorry, not no, sorry, no large K scattering from the coupling to the critical boson. And so the, the conclusion is that you do still have this conservation law associated with each point of the Fermi surface. Um, so this is a Fermi surface coupled to critical boson is something that's been very extensively studied in the context of non-Fermi liquids, although often not from very well controlled methods, but recently has been developed and said certain like large end limits in which um, it's analytically controlled. But anyway, so to these non-Fermi liquids, uh, to the extent we understand them from coupling to the critical boson would, would have this conservation law. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what would be the, 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 the exper experimental signature for between uh, like quasi particles uh, picture and non quasi particle picture. Uh, well, okay, experimental about. signature is well, for I mean, one thing that you often look at is resistivity because the um, Fermi liquid theory, the resistivity, which is actually determined by the leading irrelevant operator, uh, generally goes either as, as temperature squared or some high power of T. So if you see a power of, if you measure resistivity and see that it's scaling of some power of T that's less than two, then you know you have a non-Fermi liquid. Um, you can also look at like the, uh, in, in our pairs, you measure the spectral function, like the, the, the quasi-particle versus non-quasi-particle is related to the width of the uh, peak in the spectral function. Um, I see, I see. So in some sense, I mean, as I mentioned, there are series particular controlled examples where we have this conservation law, but we sort of think that this conservation law probably has to be general in any non-Fermi liquid just because of this theorem that if assuming it's compressible, it has to be an infinite dimensional symmetry group. Okay, in theory, it could be some different infinite dimensional symmetry group. If that was the case, it would be very interesting, but it's not clear whether that could ever happen. I think the most likely possibility is that all non-Fermi liquids actually have this emergent symmetry structure, the same as a Fermi liquid. Um, so there's one other possibility that is interesting to consider, which is that uh, in a superfluid, so superfluid spontaneously break charge conservation simply. However, that does not mean that you cannot apply a general framework. A general framework really doesn't care about spontaneous symmetry breaking as long as it's spontaneous and not 
explicit symmetry breaking. You can still apply the general framework. Uh, so similar to the spontaneously breaks charge conservation symmetry, and it's um, um, compressible as well. Um, so okay, this theorem should apply to this superfluid as well. I mean, the, the way it, does, it actually doesn't have an infinite rational symmetry group. The way it evades the theorem is that uh, it has this uh, emergent one-form symmetry. Basically, the vortex winding number, which is something that you measure on like closed curves, so that's a one-form symmetry. Uh, maybe if you don't know what a one-form symmetry is, you don't need to worry too much because it's not the main point I want to make. Um, but anyway, the uh, superfluids have this emergent one-form symmetry. Uh, I didn't mention it when I said the theorem, but uh, one-form symmetries are also uh, a, a possibility in the presence of uh, when you have a compressible system. Um, Okay, so these are the two options that we know of to, to get a compressible state of matter. Either we have this loop group symmetry, or we have this one-form symmetry like in a superfluid. So are there only other possibilities? I think that's a very important question to ask. And, uh, you know, as far as we know, I mean, we, we can think about different kinds of known states of matter, uh, exotic or not, but um, all of them are basically one of, fall under one of these two categories. I mean, there are slight variations, like the loop group could be extended by some finite one-form symmetry, which is the case where Fermi liquids coexist of topological order. So that includes things like the Fermi liquid star phase that people sometimes discuss, where the Lagrange theorem is evaluated by a constant shift due to a topological order. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's essentially kind of the compressibility still comes from this loop group. Um, so it's 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 just some slight variant of, of this. So is there anything fundamentally different than that? That's, that's the question I have to, I want to pose. I, I don't have the answer to that. All known examples seem to fit into one of these two categories. So that's an important question for the future to, to consider. Uh, so there's another theorem that I, general theorem that I can state. Um, well, it actually just, it's only a theorem in D plus one. It's a conjecture in D greater than one, D being the spatial dimension, although, this conjecture is true for, for anything that's like the, these examples. So um, the only way this conjecture could be valid it would be if there was be something fundamentally different from these. Anyway, so the theorem slash conjecture states that a system is compressible if and only if the Lowenji theory supports dissipation of statistical current, which is to say the local resistivity is exactly zero. Um, so it is sort of clear a superfluid famously has dissipation of electrical current. Um, so that's compatible with the theorem. It's comp both compressible when it has this dissipation of current. Um, maybe I need to say something a bit more about Fermi liquid theory. So in a Fermi liquid theory, you can, so you have a Fermi surplus, you can consider a, a non equilibrium state where you've created some non equilibrium charge distribution on the Fermi surface, like this. So Fermi liquid, you know, it rep also represents a current carrying state. And moreover, the state kind of has infinite lifetime, at least with respect to the uh, low energy theory because of the emergent symmetry, like the charge at each point of the Fermi surface is conserved. So this not, or charge distribution gets frozen in place, basically. And so therefore, this, the low energy description of Fermi liquid theory also has uh, exactly zero resistivity because you have this current carrying state that has infinite lifetime, so the current doesn't degrade at all. Um, and in, in fact, you can argue even beyond Fermi liquid theory, that uh, just from the statement of this emergent symmetry and Tooft anomaly, that uh, this state actually carries electrical current. So even if you didn't have a Fermi liquid, and Fermi liquid is obvious that this state carries current, you just look at the group velocity on the Fermi surface and you compute the current, it's non zero. But uh, even beyond Fermi liquid theory, assuming you know you have an emergent symmetry, the loop group and the Tooft anomaly, you conclude that this state also carries electrical current. And so, so therefore, from this loop group and anomaly, you get this dissipationless electrical current in, in great generality. And then the, the thing to mention is that um, this is all statements about the low energy theory. So at non-zero temperature, you also have oper operators, additional operators that are irrelevant to the RG sense. So these operators cause some scattering processes and that would degrade the current. Um, so, uh, so then you'll get a finite resistivity, but kind of high resistivity at low temperatures because the scattering is very slow. Sorry, very low resistivity at, at low temperatures because the scattering is very slow. Uh, so um, let me make this statement electrical current and two of is more precise. Uh, 
I consider a grand canonical ensemble state, a generalized grand canonical ensemble state, because I have this n of theta is conserved for each theta, and a theta remembers this charge density on the Fermi surface. So, so, so I can introduce a generalized chemical potential now that actually depends on theta. Um, so this is a generalized grand canonical ensemble state. And this is it's sort of like a non-equilibrium state, but it's really equilibrium with respect to this generalized ensemble that takes into account the uh, over conservation laws. And then if it's generalized grand canonical ensemble state, I don't have time to give you the derivation, but uh, if you have the uh, conservation of NF theta, so the loop group symmetry, you can show that there's a general formula that computes the current in this state. And it looks like this. So, uh, so K of theta here again is just tracing out the Fermi surface in the momentum space. Mu of theta of these generalized chemical potentials. M here is the quantized anomaly coefficient. So if you're a Fermi liquid, it's just one. And so the displacement current is actually protected by the anomaly and by the conservation law. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. So let me skip over these slides, which were not really essential to my talk. I just included them in case I had time. Um, and so I will come to the conclusion, which is that, um, okay, the conclusion is that uh, in general, the idea of emergent symmetries and anomalies are powerful ways to think about properties of energy theory. And uh, the anomalies are ideas that we originally thought about in the context of the gap topological phases and their boundaries. But for emergent symmetries, it, it's useful to think about anomalies in their own right. Um, and there are many connections to, to interesting microscopic properties like ceiling, compressibility. I talked about electrical resistivity. And I see also our uh, the paper I wrote with Central in which we specifically applied these ideas to uh, strange metals, which are an exotic uh, metallic phase seen in, in cuprates and other materials in which the resistivity is perfectly telinear down to zero temperature, which is very mysterious. Um, but we were able to try, derive pretty strong constraints on what could be going on in these strange metals based on these general arguments. Okay, so yeah, I, I will finish there. Okay, thank you, Dominique. So I, I have a question. Yeah, is there uh, some difficulty in going to D larger, la larger than two? Um, Could there be non fermi liquids in D larger than two? Yeah, there can be non fermi liquids in. Well, I think for dynamical reasons, it's sort of easier to get non fermi liquids in low dimensions, but I don't think there's any fundamental obstruction to having non fermi liquids in, in, any, in any dimension. Um, certainly, these general arguments can be applied in any dimension. Can you use your methods to prove Latinger's theorem for also for D equal three, where it was originally proven? Yes, these arguments can be applied in any dimension, in particular, you can get Latinger's theorem. So, in that so case, there's, there's going to be some interesting uh, anomaly. So, this I get is, is there some so how is this going to generalize? There's going to be n. Which is going to now be a function of two variables living on the sphere, but the commutator is going to look like what? Well, it's not a, it's not going to be about the commutator anymore. The, the commutator is is really uh, in D equals one. It's um, it becomes a little bit tricky to explain in, in simple language what it means, but what the anomaly means. Um, it's like uh, a comment this, this projective representation can, it, it's like it's for it's for same it looks like the anomaly that would appear at the boundary of a one-dimensional topological phase like the Haldane phase for example has a projective representation of spin on the boundary um so the statement in in 3d would be you would look at a um two pi flux tube which is now a one-dimensional object and it will kind of, the symmetry will act on this one dimensional object as though it was the boundary of the a two dimensional topological phase. Um, and then it's a little bit more subtle to say how the anomalous action of a symmetry works in terms of uh, two dimensional, on um, boundary of two dimensional topological phase, but there is a way to, to say it. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I don't have a, a simple, physical statement, but. Um, so what replaces the loop group, uh, the maps from uh, S1 to U1 when you go to higher dimensional spheres? Right, so the, it will be maps from like, assuming the Fermi surface is, the Fermi surface is basically like a, a sphere 
in two dimensions, in three dimensions, or at least in topologically, it's the same as the sphere. So it would be the maps from the sphere into E1. Okay. Actually, there is one thing that one can say, which is that um, in general dimension, uh, you can write an anomaly equation. This is what I skipped over. You can write an anomaly equation in terms of a non-conservation of the current. Uh, and so it turns out, uh, you know, for in, in, one, in 1 plus 1D, if the anomaly equation is related to a boundary of a 3D chern simons term, and 2 plus 1D is related to the boundary of a 5D chern simons term, and so in, in 3 plus 1D, it would be the boundary of a 7D chern simons term. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Um, so in the strange metals, there is this uh, pseudo gap phase, right? Where you the Fermi surface breaks into Fermi arcs. How yeah, I mean that's what you see experimentally. I mean, yes. I, physically, you cannot really have Fermi arcs. I mean, that's actually clear from the, these general arguments because if you try to define this anomaly. Uh, for a Fermi arc, it has an inconsistency. So it, it's pretty clear that Fermi arcs can never really happen. So uh, for what, then you, okay, then this question becomes, what is happening in the, in the pseudo gap phase? Probably, you know, there's some kind of pocket, but then you just don't see the one part of a Fermi surface because it has very low overlap with the, um, you know, with the uh, probe that you're using. I mean, I mean, yeah, the silver gap is still mysterious, but I think it must has to be something like that. It can't be a real Fermi arc. I'm sorry, what is a Fermi arc? Just, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So Fermi arc would be like a Fermi surface, but instead of being a closed surface, it just kind of is some segment of a surface and then it just ends. And it doesn't have a second boundary. Like it's not really like a, a crescent. It's really an arc. Yeah, a true Fermi arc, that's what it would be, yeah. And so how how then does this fit in, in your description? What is the um, infrared symmetry group? Well, as I said, the Fermi, uh, it cannot, it's, it's, it should be not valid to have an actual Fermi arc. What must really happen is, it, is it, it's some Fermi arc Fermi surface, closed Fermi surface, and you just not, not seen part of a Fermi surface. So then the version symmetry group would be the same as for any Fermi surface. It would be this loop group symmetry. Last call for questions. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning the, the commutator of the uh, density. Uh, uh, and yeah, so so can you explain more how, how this equation uh, works for uh, Say interacting theory because you, you, you mentioned the, the semi classical approach to to derive this. So that does it only work for free theory or, or no? This equation has to be true in general because the well, first of all, uh, we assume that interacting theory is still going to have this loop loop symmetry. I mean, because as I mentioned, uh, it sort uh, of uh, seems uh, required by this compressibility theorem. Mm -hmm. So okay, if it has the loop group symmetry. Um, then the loop group symmetry must have an uh, either anomaly or it must be trivial. But the the anomaly classification of the loop group is just z, and and it's just given by choosing the uh, integer coefficient here. So the only thing it could be for this commutator is either zero or uh, you know non-zero. If it was zero, then it wouldn't be compressible because then the filling would be zero. Um, so you kind of, by illumination, you can conclude it must look like this. Because this is the only possible form of a comedy if it's topologically invariant respect to reparameterizing theta. Um, okay. So yeah, it basically has to look like this. Okay, well, there are no further questions. Thanks a lot, Dominic, for a very interesting talk. Right. Thank you. Thank you.